Well, friends, welcome to part three of our winter teaching series here at Christchurch Lavender Bay. Indeed, we have been blessed by Paul's exposition of 1 Corinthians in part one and two. And now we get to experience uh, part three, exploring 2 Corinthians, uh, where he explains the Apostle Paul's relationship with the Corinthians, which helps us to understand what it meant for them then but more importantly, helps us to understand what it means for us now, how God related to his people and how he used his apostles at that time in their context. And so our prayer must be that he also continues to use his word in our context now. So let me pray. That. Father in heaven, we thank you that your word is timeless. We thank you that it is always relevant, no matter what the context. Father, help us to understand how Paul's relationship with the Corinthians is directly applicable to us here in our cultural context. We ask, Lord, that we might understand completely that your word is relevant to us today, as relevant as it was to them whom it was first written. We ask, Lord, that you will give Paul your spirit's voice to speak and that you might help us to hear and to understand. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Well, good evening. Thank you for watching this, the third in our series on Paul and the Corinthians. And tonight we are looking at 2 Corinthians. I uh, hope you find the series interesting, but also challenging. Paul wrote his second letter to the Corinthians in about the year AD 56 from somewhere in Macedonia, quite possibly from Berea. Now, that means that it's only 23 or so years on from Jesus. So it's quite amazing that we have such a profound letter as 2 Corinthians, as it were, so early within Christian history. One of the things about this letter that is interesting is that <clears throat> it's all internal matters between Christians or professed Christians. Apart from Paul's pastoral letters, I think all his other letters, Paul is engaging with cultural non-Christian matters which are impinging on various churches. But there's none of that in 2 Corinthians. A lot of it in 1 Corinthians, but not in 2 Corinthians. So Paul is dealing, as we will see, <clears throat> with two basic problems within the church. One was a local problem, which had been on the boil, as it were, for some time. And the other was that a new a group of rival Christian missionaries had arrived in Corinth and were attempting to dislodge Paul and take over the church. So that's just some sort of an idea of what follows, which as I say, I hope you'll find not only interesting, uh, but also challenging. Well, a couple of pictures to begin with. The left hand one has the remains of the temple of Apollo in the background and it's, it's kind of signature picture for Corinth. Um, that was many years ago when that temple was built and for the last 100 years Corinth has been a Roman colony. It's interesting that a majority of the inscriptions in Corinth at the time Paul was there were Latin, an indication very much of its uh, status as a Roman colony. The other picture <clears throat> uh, is called the Bema, B-E-M-A. And the word Bema means a judgment seat, a seat on which a magistrate judges somebody. And where I'm standing there is where the Apostle Paul would have been standing and the governor Gallio would have been up there on some sort of a bench or seat passing judgment on Paul, Bema, B-E-M-A. Interestingly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says we must all appear before the Bema, the judgment seat 
of Christ. So that's a nice little connection with archaeology and uh, the text of the Bible. Second Corinthians is probably Paul's most difficult letter, but it's also his most personal and heart-moving. These words that appear in chapter 6, I think, are heartfelt. Uh, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. He says, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted in us or by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. So my heart is wide with love for you, but in response, yours is like that to me. So he says, in return, reciprocally, as it were, I speak as to children, my children, my spiritual children, I'm your spiritual father, he says, as my heart is wide for you, please widen yours for me. That's a very heartfelt statement, isn't it, and reflects a lot of spiritual pain on the part of Paul. As an outline for the letter, the first couple of chapters are Paul's explanation why he changed his travel plans, which the Corinthians misunderstood and resented. Then from 2.14 to 7.16, Paul outlines his theology of the new covenant. Then in 8 and 9, he appeals to them to complete the collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. They had begun the collection, but um, because things had fallen off the cart in their relationship with Paul, uh, they had stopped putting their money aside week by week. So 8 and 9 are his appeal for them to resume putting their money aside, which would be collected later and taken to Judea. But in 10 to 12, we have his defence against false apostles, about whom I'll say a little more in a moment. But part of that last section is a very strange speech that he makes, which is sometimes called the fool's speech. He's a fool for Christ's sake, as he will indicate. And then there's a final uh, appeal at the end of the letter. So Paul and Timothy wrote this letter from Macedonia in 56, and it addresses two problems. The first problem is the church's criticism of Paul for the way he has handled a moral offender within the church, and related to that is their strong unhappiness with him about a letter that he wrote (coughs) which hasn't survived. The other problem, which was bigger, was the challenge of newly arrived counter-missionaries. So Paul engages these quite different problems throughout the church, throughout the letter, I should say. On the left is the uh, photograph of the last remaining shop in Corinth. And we can imagine that Priscilla and Aquila, who were tent makers and sellers of tents and leathers, occupied a shop like that. And we can imagine Paul working alongside them in a shop like that. The other photograph is across the main marketplace or agora of Corinth and in some ways Corinth is disappointing to visit because almost nothing has been done in the 20 or more years that Anita and I have been going there. Uh, The local authorities have done nothing that I could ever think of in any way of restoring the various elements on the site. By contrast The Turkish archaeological authorities are very proactive in what they do. Uh, It was many years when I first went to Laodicea and it was just a greenfield site with the odd stone poking up out of the grass. 
Today, there's been absolutely revolution in archaeological restoration, amphitheaters being reconstructed, um, other buildings being reconstructed, several cranes working on the site, small armies of archaeologists and students uh, helping to restore what was a beautiful city back then. But poor old Corinth is um, just li lies there in semi-ruined state and it's uh, a bit sad really. The, the photograph on the right hand side in the background is the hill, small mountain, um, which is behind the city of Corinth. It's called the Acro Corinth. It was fairly typical in the ancient world for people to build cities near mountains so that in the case of invasion they would take up residents on the mountain and defend themselves from up there. Uh, the Acro Corinth was where the temple of Aphrodite was located with a thousand cult prostitutes. And it was water uh, that was found in the Acro Corinth that made its way by a spring down to the plain below and on the left hand side is the area where the water was collected uh, that came down from the Acro Corinth which was the water supply for the city of Corinth and so people would have to come there with their buckets and so on uh, to take water away to their homes but you can see what I mean when it's all a bit desolate and that's a site that uh, is sufficiently intact for it to be reconstructed further to give people an idea of what it really was like back then. So the first problem that Paul faces is this hostility toward him. And it went back to the problem of the incestuous man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a problem that the Corinthians didn't do anything about. Paul appeals to them in the letter in chapter 5 to do what he advises and Timothy was to come and uh, among other things uh, monitor the Corinthians uh, response to Paul's advice. Uh, clearly that had, had not happened and so Timothy returned unsuccessful to Ephesus where Paul was. Paul was so alarmed by the situation that he made a, an unscheduled visit to the city of Corinth from Ephesus. He refers to it as a painful visit, an occasion when he was wronged, he was very badly treated, and so he returned to uh, Ephesus <clears throat> as it were saddened and defeated in his uh, pastoral objectives when he went. He then wrote them a letter which hasn't survived, uh, which he says was written with, with many tears. It was evidently a very strong letter and I suspect some kind of an ultimatum for the Corinthians to put their house in order. Um, so he sent them the letter which they greatly resented and also he had indicated during that painful visit that he would return to them in the near future but instead of doing that, he sent this, this letter. And you can depict, you can pick out their anger at the letter by what they had to say about it in 2, in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, where they said, his, late, his letters are weighty and strong. That's a, pain, that's a letter written in tears. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. That's a damning reaction. And that was the way in which many, many of the Corinthians, it would appear, thought of Paul. So they're saying he's, um, he's like a lion from a distance by letter, but when he actually turns up, it's a great disappointment. He is at the same time a bully and a coward. So that's a pretty difficult situation, isn't it, pastorally speaking, that Paul faced when he wrote this letter. Um, 
as well as that, many of the Corinthians accused you of being cunning and crafty, that this collection that he had established from, the, from all the churches to send money back to Judea for the poor Christians there because of the famine, they said, ha, 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 that money is actually intended for Paul's pocket. And so um, Paul has, must, must devote quite a lot of the letter to uh, explanation and also defense, Greek word is apologia. And near the end of the letter he says, have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? Question mark. Well, yes, Paul, that's ex exactly what you have been doing. And then he reassures them, it is in the sight of God that we've been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. So the words in the sight of God are almost um, an oath. They are a solemn assurance that he's speaking the truth and he's speaking that truth as a Christian, speaking in Christ as a man united uh, to Christ and in Christ. So on the way through the letter, Paul points to a number of key matters about his behaviour. First of all, his sincerity. He says, for our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we have behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. And a bit later, for we're not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Um, our word sincerity is an, it's an important word. Uh, people used to often sign off their letters, yours sincerely. Um, it is appeal to um, truthfulness, to having good intentions, uh, to being humble and other things as well. But the Greek word literally means tested by the sun, S-U-N, sun. It's as if you are in a place with relatively little light um, and you have a document with writing on it and you can't make it out too well because the light's not so good. So you take it out under the sun with the brightness of the light that shines on the page you can read it. And that's what Paul says about him, that uh, if you examine his life, you will find that he is in fact a truthful and decent person. So that's the, um, the first word that he says about himself. Secondly, he speaks about his integrity. Therefore, he says, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, he doesn't indicate what he actually means by disgraceful, underhanded ways or what cunning was involved, but there's a fair chance it's a reference to money, that Paul was presenting the appeal to collect money for the poor saints back in Jerusalem, but that in a crafty way he had intended it for his own pocket. So he says he has renounced such behaviour, uh, but rather his life is an open statement of the truth and he invites the Corinthians to um, examine his life in real time, as it were, and he assures them that they will come up to the conclusion that he is indeed 
a man of integrity. He also speaks about his authority, which I think goes back to what happened on the road to Damascus, when God addressed him and called him to preach the Son of God among the Gentiles. It was at that time that God gave him the authority to uh, not only preach the gospel and create churches, but for building them up. Um, he, he did not intend that Paul would be destroying churches, but there's a slight hint there that if the Corinthians don't come up, that uh, in fact they will in fact be destroyed. But no, it's a positive thing that God has given the Apostle Paul to do uh, and so he speaks of that authority. Um, he's a, he has the authority as an apostle. The fourth quality that Paul refers to is his uh, commitment to reconciliation. Now, as it happens, the um, incestuous man had in fact repented, turned from his evil ways, and so the question, the problem was though that some of the Corinthians had not been prepared to restore him to their membership even though he had turned away from his behaviour. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul has a very interesting se section in which we see Paul the reconciler, Paul the peacemaker. And so he says, for such a one, this offender, this punishment by the majority is enough. The fact that there's a majority also implies there's a minority. So the church is divided. And so Paul is really teaching here in a way of restoring the man and restoring unity to the church as well. So he says you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. That's a lovely statement, isn't it? And it's an indication, it's a window into the heart of Paul, a peacemaker who seeks to bring people together uh, in Christ. The theme of reconciliation is uh, really spelled out in chapter 5, 18 and following. And it's one of the most majestic and noble statements uh, that Paul ever wrote and it's, it's, it's a brilliant statement of the cross of Christ, the nature of ministry. So here are these Corinthians who because they are out of sorts with him and because they are warming to these newcomers who've come, they slip, slip, slipping away. And so Paul lays a foundation under their feet on which they can stand and be reconciled to God. <clears throat> so it's, God was in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself. God was making peace with the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, forgiving them, and entrusting to us apostles the message of reconciliation. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, and it's this, we implore you on behalf of Christ, in Christ's place, as if Christ were standing here, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And how does that happen? For our sake. God made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the Lord Jesus, as it were, was cloaked and enveloped in our sins even though he was sinless on the cross so that as a result of that suffering and death we might become the righteousness of God in him. So there's a plea to them to get right with God. 
a group of people who are slipping away. And then he adds to his appeal to them to be right with God, to be right with him, Paul, their apostle. The passage we looked at before, our heart is wide open, yours is not, but in return I speak as the children, widen your hearts also so that we may be at peace with one another, reconciled to one another. Paul the peacemaker. And the other one to refer to in the fifth is the comfort giver. He begins the letter by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And then a little later in the letter, he says, at a time when he was indeed depressed and downcast, waiting for Titus to come back from the Corinthians, God who comforts the downcast, what a statement, God who comforts the downcast, comforted us, by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, Corinthians. So God has comforted Paul so that Paul has comforted other people. The Corinthians have comforted Titus, and Titus had comforted Paul, and it's all from God. <clears throat> what, a, what a beautiful picture of pastoral relationships between Christian people all going back to the great truth that our God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is a Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. You can see by these inspired words uh, why 2 Corinthians is regarded such a majestic Christian statement. Well, that's the end of the first section, as it were, to deal with the problems within Corinth, going back to the incestuous man, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul's uns Peter, Timothy's unsuccessful visit, Paul's unsuccessful visit, Paul's unpopular letter, and so on. So we, we leave that theme behind now and we come to the other theme which is so important within the letter, probably more so, namely the arrival of a counter mission. Back in the year 47 AD, there was a meeting in Jerusalem between the leaders of the Jerusalem church, James, Kephas, Peter, and John on the one hand, and Barnabas and Paul on the other. And they made an agreement that the James, Peter, and John would concentrate on evangelism among Jews, whereas Barnabas and Paul would concentrate on evangelism of non-Jews. So there were two, as it were, theological and ethnic jurisdictions. The Greek word that's used there is kanon, which means a measuring rod. And uh, each, as it were, had, had a measuring rod. Now, one of the problems with these newcomers is that they were, they were Jews and they were seeking to promote a version of Christian Judaism among the Corinthians. That was a clear breach with the agreement, the Bishni Agreement in Jerusalem from the year 47. And so these newcomers, we, we don't have any names, they sought to match Paul in message and ministry, but so as to supersede him and thus exclude him, installing 
themselves in his place. So it's a very, very serious situation. Uh, these newcomers have come in such a way as to actually kick Paul out of his place as an apostle among Gentile people preaching the Son of God. And there are astonishing parallels between these two missions. Uh, if we study the whole letter, we discover, yes, Paul is a Jew, but they too are Jews, 1122. Paul calls himself a minister, a diakonos. They call themselves ministers. He calls himself an apostle. They call themselves apostles. He preaches the word of God. They preach what they say is the word of God. He preaches the gospel. They preach the gospel. He preaches Jesus. They preach Jesus. Only one problem, according to Paul. They preach another Jesus. And they preach a different gospel. Now, it's not altogether clear what the differences were. But it seems they place little or no emphasis on the cross of Christ. And they put a lot of emphasis on keeping the conditions of the old covenant. And so the central reality of the crucifixion and the cross of Christ appears to be minimized, if not excluded, by them. Paul refers to them negatively by three epithets within the letter. First is they peddle the word of God. Now the word peddle is used at that time of those who peddle corrupt products, say wine. It's a picture perhaps of a wine seller. He's got his donkey, he's got his little cart, He's got a big cask on the back of it, and it's, he's come along to sell first quality red wine, shall we say. Only one problem, that is, he has drawn off a considerable, considerable quality of wine from the cask and topped it up with water. So he's selling a diluted product for profit. And so the suggestion is that these newcomers, as it were, have had their hands out for money uh, for their ministry. And Paul has been very careful, hasn't he, not to accept any payment for money. Secondly, he calls them false apostles, pseudopostoloi, who have a mask as ministers of righteousness, a masquerade as such, but they're actually, he says, ministers of Satan. Because they are now calling people back into a now superseded Old Testament covenant. And as I say, they appear to be silent or minimize the message of the cross. So they're peddlers, they're false apostles. And thirdly, he calls them Super apostles, Hyperlian apostoloi. Now, an interesting thing is that scholars have researched this word Hyperlian and they can find no evidence of the use of this word before the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5. So Paul has invented, it's coined a word to mock these people. Hyper means more. Leon means very. So these are self-styled super-duper apostles, Hyperlean apostoloi. Their self-proclaimed superiority over Paul. They're better than Paul. So why do you bother with Paul anymore? Show him the door. We've come with a real message. We are gifted people. Look at us, how good we are. They appear to have letters of introduction perhaps from the mother church in Jerusalem. They are superior speakers, orators. They have visions and revelations. They appear to be those who have performed miracles. And perhaps most important of all, they are fit and healthy. 
And look at Paul, poor, miserable Paul. He's got his thought in the flesh, whatever it was. He's got this problem and that problem. He goes from place to place, bearing all sorts of physical and other burdens. But look at us. We are, we are fit and strong. Uh, I mean, anyone who claims to be an apostle of the risen Christ will surely be fit and strong. No, no, he isn't. Just look at him. Look, look at us. Look at us. Look how superior we are to us. How does Paul respond to their claims of superiority? Well, he does a very daring thing. He identifies himself as one who does suffer. He uses the word weaknesses, not so much weakness. He's not saying it's a weak person, but he he suffers weaknesses, by which he means sufferings in the cause of missionary work. And he outlines those sufferings in many places in this letter, but most particularly of all in the fool's speech in chapters 11 and 12. He speaks about being flogged in the Jewish synagogue. He speaks about being flogged in the marketplaces of the cities. He speaks about hunger, thirst, shipwreck, anxiety. Um, and he indicates that these are, if you like, a continuation of the cross of Christ. But at the same time, he has enjoyed victory and perseverance out of these problems. So his life, in a sense, also reflects the resurrection of Christ. So Paul's very ministry, as it were, is aligned to what happened when Jesus was crucified and risen, and Paul's life is the embodiment of that as he continues his ministry. And this occurs in the text of the letter on a number of places, one of which is in chapter 4 and verse 7, another very moving passage. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay, this treasure being the knowledge of God, knowing God. It's, it's probably a little picture drawn from those uh, little clay receptacles which held oil which you had a wick in them and which lit so it has as it were the, the treasure of light within it but the bearer of the treasure is a cheap clay easily broken clay pot that's Paul outwardly he's a cheap clay pot easily broken but within him is the precious knowledge of God. And so he says, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. The fact that the cheap clay pot continues is not due to itself, but to the resurrection power of God at work in Paul's life. He continues... We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Death, resurrection. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Cross, resurrection. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair, but not, once again. Struck down, but not destroyed. So yes, Paul can say to these super fit, uh, impressive, super apostles, yes, he says, I agree with you. It's all true. Um, I'm caring about the body of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. He preaches the death and resurrection of Jesus and his life is the embodiment of the death and the resurrection of Jesus 
It's power in weakness. And then he says, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So he says, the missionary weaknesses, the sufferings that I have incurred are to bring life to you. There is no life, no missionary life without death, without true sacrifice that is often deeply physical in character. My wife Anita's mum and dad went as missionaries uh, to Brazil, to the interior of Brazil. He died there as a young man in his late 30s. Quite some years ago, Anita and I had the opportunity of going back to one of those towns where he had established the Christian gospel. And there they were. We went to the church. There they were, singing hymns, reading the Bible, praying, talking about local missionary work. You see, there's life. But how'd that life come to them? It, it came to them through the death of Alexander Simpson. It's exactly what Jesus says, unless the, unless the, the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But he says it's resurrection out of that. But first comes the suffering and death, which lies at the heart of that kind of missionary work. So the, it's not an easy letter, is it? So there are these um, rather difficult ideas and a difficult argument to follow. But I'm sure we can pick up something at least of the passion of Paul for the, for the Lord Jesus and his death and resurrection and how that provided, as it were, the template for his own mission and the basis for his defence against these super apostles. Some scholars refer to this phenomenon as Christoformity, in life, death, message and ministry. That was Paul's apologetic, that was his answer. The demonstration that he was a better minister of Christ than his rivals. So in the full speech, he boasts of weaknesses, he mocks their boasting of superiority, and he thereby authenticates himself as a minister of the crucified but resurrected Christ while at the same time he delegitimizes their claims. So what is the message of this letter? Paul faced long-term relationship problems with the Corinthians and the recent crisis caused by the arrival of rival missionaries. Now, could have, Paul could have dealt briefly with these issues in a few terse words. Complete the collection, show the newcomers a door. Simple as that. But no, Paul likes to explain things. He likes to establish principles. He, does, he just doesn't give orders and directions, but he explains, he explains, he explains, so that he establishes principles of Christian truth and behavior, so that the Corinthians will themselves be sufficiently equipped by having the strength of Christian understanding within their hearts and minds, so that independently of Paul being there, they will think and they will act Christianly. 
Paul certainly did it to re-engage with the congregation, to re-establish reconciliation with them, and to argue that it was by the preaching of the cross and the resurrection and his life experience of the cross and resurrection that legitimised his ministry and de-legitimised the false apostles' ministry. The issue of the rival mission was more important than the local problem. He introduced it early and it dominates the latter part of the letter. It is a set of peace exposition of reconciliation with God in the passage in chapter 5. Well, we draw near the end. Paul was confident, he says, that the Corinthians are in the faith. Um, he understood that godly outcomes depends on godly spiritual maturity. So in the passage about the collection, he not only says complete the collection, but he explains over two important chapters that the completion of the collection must flow out of their grasp of divine reconciliation and their acceptance of Paul's ministry and their rejection of the newcomer's ministry. So basic was the need of the Corinthians to trust the moral integrity of the writer. This explains Paul's care in establishing his sincerity, his integrity, himself as a comfort giver, reconciler, who spoke with the authority of God. So moral character is an indispensable basis for pastoral ministry. Those who preach the gospel must embody its values and its morality. Nobody will listen to a preacher who is a liar, untrustworthy, sexually immoral, or a hypocrite. And Paul establishes the claim that he was none of those things. So the power of Christ's example in ministers and believers is the continuing message of this letter. Just a few things to say in conclusion. The ever-reliable Titus carried the message, the, the letter I should say, from Macedonia to Corinth. The congregation would gather in the villa of Gaius and Titus would read the letter. We are interested to know how they responded. Well, there's good reason to think they responded positively. Two reasons. First of all, we know from Romans that they completed the collection. On the first day of the week, or the first days of the week, as it were, they began once again to put their money aside, which would be taken ultimately to Jerusalem. They completed the collection. Secondly, the fact that the letter is in our canon of scripture means that the Corinthians received the letter and welcomed the letter. So it finds its way for that reason into the canon um, and it becomes therefore part of sacred scripture. There is a sad end to this, which I didn't, I hope I didn't have to make, but I have to. And it is that despite Paul's efforts, um, four letters that he wrote to them, three visits, uh, the, the church in Corinth never became a force for Christianity in the world at that time. About 40 years later, a Christian leader from Rome, whose name was Clement, wrote them a long letter. Why did he write the letter? Because the, the Corinthians continued to squabble with one another. 
and they continued to be divided. <clears throat> so the challenge to us is that we want our church, Christ Church Lavender Bay, to be a force for Jesus. I'm sure we do. Well, that means we need to identify our shortcomings and repent of them. Our society has turned its back on Jesus and is running in the opposite direction. So we need to be united in faith, hope and love as we proclaim and live out the message of Jesus. Thank you very much.